Hey guys, what's going on? It's Andy Elliott. Welcome to the One Percenter Podcast. By the way, I got a special guest today, my smoking hot wife, Jacqueline Elliott. By the way, listen, just just because I know she's about to, I'm going to interview her today, by the way. Um, she's the CEO of our company. We would not have our business if it wasn't without her. I wouldn't have changed my life if she wouldn't have told me the cold, hard truth, been direct to me, and literally said, get your shit together. And I want to tell you guys, as I talk to her, like she built everything that we have. And I know that I'm the face and I know that people see me all the time, but truly the person that mentors me and pushes me and the person that I look up to is sitting over here. All right. So I asked her, I said, Hey babe, stop what you're doing, right? Come over here for a minute. And I want to share you with the world. So Jacqueline Elliott. Thank you so much for having me. Okay. Mr. So Elliot. we're going to talk first and foremost, since obviously I just get, told you, uh, or told everybody that she runs our company. She leads it. She does everything. I don't have a meeting without her. Let's talk about leadership. Cause that's my, that's my main goal. Um, what would you say are the values that the world's missing with leadership? Why are there so many companies that can't scale grow? Why are we growing so damn fast? I know why it, it is, but why, what are, what are most industries missing? What is missing in the world with leadership? What do you see missing? Like if we were going to run a leadership, are you going to let me talk or you're going to yeah. keep asking me the same question over and over? Just kidding. Just kidding. So I think that a lot of people preach the same thing and it's mostly words like a lot of people say leadership it's the culture we need to make sure we have good culture we need to make sure we have our core values all that stuff is all great i think that what is missing in leadership is basically leading the, by example mm -hmm. putting in that hard work and really showing your team that you're not too good to keep doing that by going we we still do that we still go pick up the trash we still work harder than anybody else so as leaders we make sure that everybody else you know wants to because we are their mentors we've worked hard to be their mentors and earn the right to be their mentors mm -hmm. that they're always constantly chasing and trying to prove themselves all the time we're constantly trying to prove ourselves to them still it's like in marriage I'm constantly trying to prove myself as a wife to you and that's why we keep it new oh he's smiling now yeah, yes she sure does but I always have to prove myself to our team I always have to prove myself to the kids I always have to prove myself in everything I do and I think that's basically the first act of leadership is making sure that you can continue to do that and continue to push and grow and not show that you're too good to do it anymore so step one is going to be work harder than everybody else yeah work harder than everybody else and re and reprove which means on a daily basis while you're why you're capable of being the leader to lead these people yeah show them that you care so you're show saying and so you think in the world right now a lot of people get a position they get a title um, when it's new they try their hardest they're proving but once right. the newness wears off then they fall apart yeah most of the reasons when we start something and we see the good in it it fades away and it becomes something that we despise or hate because it's just you lose that edge you lose that want of trying to keep it new and prove yourself. Mm -hmm. So it just kind of turns into a job and we don't see it as a job. We're constantly creating new ideas and things on how we can push ourselves to that next level. And in turn, it shows, it's like, you know, if we lead by example, it shows our team to want to do the same. Mm -hmm. Feed me more leadership. What else do we do that you would say, anybody watching this, if they want to really build an empire, mm -hmm. something special? Well, something that's very unique, I think, is a lot of times, you know, a lot of business owners try to keep, you know, business in their personal life or they're not allowed to talk certain things or share certain things with their employees. I believe that there is some type of line, I guess you should say, but it shouldn't really be what most people say. Like we are, we show if you are a good leader and you show that you're pushing your people, but you also have that vulnerable side where they feel you have a heart, then you can do so much mm. more because it makes your employees or your team be open to show that side of them, their weaknesses and all of that mm. so that they can make sure that you can empower them to grow and you're not just using that against them. Hey guys, what's going on? It's Andy. A lot of you leave comments. Tell me that you need help do me a favor I'm gonna tell you the best way to get a hold of me shoot me a text message right now 918-210-0254 918-210-0254 I'll help you with whatever you need I got your back for life let's get back to the video so we can be very direct with our people as long as we show heart 
you know, I think that's very, very important, being able to be direct and open with your team where they see that if you tell them something or you might be criticizing, I, 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 that's probably the wrong word, or you might be critiquing something that they're doing that you know they can be better at. But if they know that you're telling them and it comes from a level of care in that you really see another version of them that you know that they're capable of doing that they might not actually see themselves and you give them those eyes and that vision to see that the same thing you see then they believe in themselves because without that if I'm just criticizing them or telling them or nitpicking at them I would just be the bitch and we bring that heart in it so I think it's very important you can talk about everything with your team if you do it right you can have your team to come up with you with problems in every single way and not feel like they're complaining because you can also go in the opposite direction and they can feel like they're complaining to you and you become mm -hmm. you know a pillow for them to cry in, and then it go, goes on and leads on other ways but if you can show them and you can basically tell them, hey, you know what, this is what you're good at, and I foresee you being this leader or whatever it is, then they'll fight to the end of the world for you mm -hmm. because they know you believe in them. I love that. Um, with with being there with people, uh, this is something that I don't really hear any leaders talk about, but something that we do, um, and I want you to explain, is being there with people on your in your team or, on your com or in your company um, when things are hard. Mm-hmm. Right, because yeah. most people want to cheer people on when it's good, right. when a top producer's breaking records. Um, but what about when it's when it's hard, when our people struggle? Right. Most leaders back off. We seem to more to lean in. We do. We do lean in because I think that a lot of times, I mean, we always talk about this all the time. Like, we don't know what you really have until the shit hits rock bottom or hard or you get tested in so many different ways. You know, we have such a good team and such good culture and everybody looks at us from the outside like you guys are perfect. You don't have any problems. We run into things and we're very adaptable mm -hmm. and we just kind of grow and we don't hit take things so like hard in the sense that, that, that most people do when things crumble or you might have a bad day and instead of us going being like, hey, you know, this person's lazy or this person doesn't care anymore because leaders, we can make that mistake in doing mm -hmm. that. And that's what most people do. They see somebody that's you going through. You diagnose it wrong. Yeah, you misdiagnose because you're not digging in. You, you haven't earned the right to get that information in the first place. And that goes back to the last thing I was talking about. Mm -hmm. If you were to talk and keep an open relationship where they don't have to walk on eggshells with you, they'll open up when there's a problem Problem and you almost know the thing that makes us so unique is I know how everybody is and I can sense just by looking at them and I don't even need necessarily need to talk to them I can sense there's a problem in the room and I go directly and I'm like hey what's going on and then they just melt and then we can talk about it and then that it, it's always gonna come out to be better because they know that you know we are gonna stick with them no matter what and that's the reason why they're so loyal and there's they fight so hard for us because they know it's a two-way street it's not just gonna be one-sided we're gonna fight for them and they're gonna fight for us and it mm -hmm. just goes in that way so yeah so Jackie's talking about like a circle of safety as mm -hmm. in like hey most companies they'll be cool with you as long as you're hitting the numbers right as long as you're hitting the results and then when something isn't right, they're going to be like, dude, what's your problem? Or get your shit together or else, right? And then it's a threat. Right. And we've never threatened anybody in our company. We've always kept a circle of safety that says, look, if we hired you, it's because we believe in you. And if we believe in you, we're going to push you to your max potential. We understand right. that you're going to have great days. We understand that you're going to get your ass kicked. But include us in all of that. Include yeah, us in all that yeah. so we don't misdiagnose, so we don't think something about you that's not actually true. And most of the time we can help you through anything yeah. or at least we'll have, a, we'll have a talk about it because all of the people that came to our company, I mean 90% of them, come from out of state. They don't have any family around and we've become that family. We've built our own family with our team and so we need to have that. There's not really an actor switch or there's not there's no boundaries like we talk to the kids we talk to the wives we talk to everybody in the group and we take them in as our family and that's why we can do that yeah um what about like family being included right like mm -hmm. in the work yeah right because like listen we've broken like every rule yes. to what we were taught right mm -hmm. you know keep your family out of here but we've allowed families to come into our job and they perform like 20x higher when, right. when they take their family with them, right? Right. Um, so, it, I mean, I can just tell you by... Like, we're breaking every rule. So, understand this. Everybody always asks, like, how did you grow your business so quick? Well, that's why I'm having my wife explain some things today, like... And stuff that we haven't really shared And I just a lot forgot with. what I was going to say because you just interrupted No, me. I was talking about family. <laughs> yeah. Well, I was talking about family, like... like Every day, our, our, the wives and the husbands of the people that work here like come up to work and have lunch. And Well, what I think I was going to say was, like, 
I think that we learn the hard way. We were taught, like, you know, when we had our normal jobs, we were taught that, you know, you go to work and you keep your wife happy and, you know, keep her queen of the castle, give her what she needs, give, buy her the cars, give her the house, give her ma- everything she needs to buy for the kids and, you know, everything is okay. That's what success looks like. That's what we were taught. So naturally, a lot of times what we see in families, we see that the business and the relationship is, is almost like they, they, they're combative toward each other. It's like, mm-hmm. hey, you're spending your time at work. You're not giving us time at home and all these different things. Mm-hmm. So what we had to discover before we even started our business is if we were both on the same mission, we had the same dreams together, and we grew together, you know, then we had to really identify what success really looked like to us. And then we decided to grow in that way. So before we actually built the business, we kind of became those marriage millionaires where I wanted to be, you know, the battle mate in that sense and grow together. And that's why we were allowed to push. But now that we have a team, like we have the wives come in and they just like they're so in love with the culture and what we what we have because we push our guys and our women obviously to Super be hard. better versions of themselves and we're not like we have core values that we have in our company and we're like hey these are the core values you pick up your stuff you do this you you're you're a good person you take care of people you treat them the right way you trust god you do all of these different things that make you an outstanding human while you're here but we talk to the wives and we're like, okay, this is this is what this looks like at work. But when this person gets home and he's not fulfilling these core values, that means he's a fraud. So you need to take that home and he needs to be good to you and he needs mm-hmm. to give you the attention that you're there and you're gonna help us push you push him, you know, when he's there. Don't let him complain when he comes home. You know, make sure he has the energy that he needs to for you and the kids. Make sure he's spending quality time. We had to kick the people out of the office on Valentine's Day and tell them, hey, go spend time with your families, go do this stuff. We empower them to bring their family along on this journey. And typically it's not it's not like that. That's not what we were taught. Mm-hmm. We had to learn the hard way. We had to go against each other and fight and learn all these yeah, things and we th- different Valentine's things. We missed Valentine's Day most times because yeah. we were both working. Yeah, we were both working. We had sales jobs and it was like Nobody it was, was busy. telling us to go home. Nobody was. And the thing is that when you do that with your team, when you tell them, hey, the alarms are going to be set at 9 o'clock. You better get your asses out of here because we need you to go get some rest. We don't need you here. Then they're like, oh, shoot, I got to go home. Like they're having so much fun and they Mm -hmm. love what they do so much that they don't even want to leave sometimes. We have to push them out. And it's, it's a whole different thing. But when you have the whole family involved, when we celebrate the wives' birthdays, the kids' birthdays, and we do pinatas here at the office and cake flips and all these different things, Every birthday and we include everybody, it makes it more of a family. And they feel like, man, nobody does that. So, you know, it's not about, you know, just money. It's not about a job. It's a lifestyle. It's being a better person altogether. Okay. So everybody I talk to, I mean, everybody's like, dude, I want to build a team like yours. Mm -hmm. Like, I want a culture like yours. Like, we want a team like Elliott Army. However, let's talk 99% of the people in our company were all underdogs and were all lost, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So let's talk about that. Why do you feel like that we can take 100 of these great people with their shit together and put them against one of our people that were broken and lost, and when we develop these people – they're just so much more dangerous. Well, I'm going to I'm going to flip it on you a little bit, okay? Building what we have has taken a lot of work, okay? It's not an easy thing. But I think a lot of people when they're hiring, they try to find qualified people that really know like they're they're, they're very skilled and they have like they're, they're like the best they've done something else, you know, or whatever that that kind of compliments them and they're trying to get that incorporated. What we do is we actually go to the underdogs because we're the underdogs we go to the products of our training the one that started from rock bottom the one that had to prove himself the one that had needed to go through the grind that probably had a bad childhood when they were small you know or something like that you know mm-hmm. something that they had that impacted them that they're like man you know what I am ready to do good and change somebody's life. Somebody that somebody's going to be on the phone with them and the other person on the line could be going through hell and this person's going to really understand them and really take that to heart and be like, you know what? I was in your shoes and I can help you because I learned with Andy or Jacqueline or the Elliot group that 
I can be better and I am this and this I'm the example now and that's what we want we want that success story nobody wants to watch a Hollywood film of somebody that had everything handed to them and they didn't have to fight for it no everybody loves Rocky you know because Rocky got his ass beat you know he's an overcomer and that's why they love him and that's us but most businesses they want to take the shortcuts they want to find the qualified people well guess what happens they're thinking oh the qualified person is always like hey you know what I can do better somewhere else or if I were in this position I, I deserve to make more money or I I could do so much better doing this this and that they're always thinking outside of there here with our people what we really do is we tell them like and they don't really feel like they deserve to be here in the very beginning they're like oh my gosh like I don't know and it's almost like a battle that they have inside that they're like man I don't know like they're almost intimidated they feel like they they're not worthy of the position and we have to basically beat it in them and be like, hey, you know what? You're great. This is part of the process. We're going to mold you. We're going to train you. We're going to get you to be that because you're going to be the best success story the world has ever seen. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're attracted to. And that's how you build loyalty and people that will stick with you because we're not just hiring the perfect candidate. We're mm -hmm. hiring the broken candidate that yeah. really just wants to prove themselves. Well, you screen people by their heart. Right. 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 So explain that. When we screen people, most people screen for like, what did you do at your last job? Right. And yeah. we screen. They're looking for the, you know, the qualifying candidates. They're looking for the people that know all of the information. They're looking for the person that basically interviews perfectly. I ask them questions that basically try to talk them out of working with us. And I tell them basically like, hey, you know, what is it that, that you did at your last job that you don't like? And all these different, uh, the different things to see how much they complain about it or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And I tell them how hard it is to be a part of our team, how much we demand, you know, all of these different things that they need to do so I almost basically talk them out of it but I also look for how coachable are they mm -hmm. how much are they listening to what I'm telling them and does this person really have a shot just by me looking at them I can tell if they have a heart and they really care about people mm -hmm. so if they have a heart and if they're coachable shoot we can work wonders with those people and those are the people that we really want in our group I love that all right so I always talk about like when I was 39 right and like I was just going through life yeah. And we, we were big, just going you're through a life. big baby in many, many instances in our life. We had a lot of recreation moments. Hey. But 39 was the biggest, and thank God, because we have Andy Elliott today. Well, let's talk about that real quick, okay. right? Okay. Um, let's go back to the Why minute. Why are you giving me the little smirk? Let, let's go back to the minute that you grabbed my love handle and you, you squeezed it. Yeah, and, the, the, and the minute and, and that, that, that was story. not very pretty. Because a lot of people are gonna, they're they're not gonna, they they don't understand this. But since it was just me and you in the room, mm -hmm. right? Right. And I got my shirt off, and I'm just getting ready for work, and it's just a normal day, and then all of a sudden you grab my love handle. Well, you out were kind of kinda, you were kind of walking around in the kitchen, and I remember exactly where it was. Is right next to the island. And I remember, you know, just just the days over and over of you coming home and just being kind of like, call it one dimensional because you were just kind of just thinking about work, you know, and you were just kind of just going like, but there was another level even at work that I was like, he's missing. He's missing that spark that I knew that you had. And when you come home with the kids, they're also, you're missing that newness from when we first had our kids and when we would get excited about doing stuff, you weren't really there. Like I had like shown you some pictures of the kids. I remember before that and you were kind of like, uh, you know, like you couldn't really remember those moments in those pictures that had happened that same week. I don't know if you remember that, but I was going over over these pictures and telling you, hey, do you remember when, you know, this happened and this happened and you were, you were just lost. You were just not there. So then I was like, you know, I saw you and I was like, man, you know, like, what is our life becoming? You know, like, and I know how important fitness was to you because when I met you, you were in shape, you know, you weren't the healthiest because you were just too big and bulky. You know, we worked on that later, but then all of a sudden I noticed that in, in your work, you weren't passionate. You know, I noticed that with the kids, you weren't passionate. I noticed that you weren't really like looking at me with those same love eyes that you would look at me in the past. And I was like, okay, so I'm just like, okay, you were always a good husband. You're always there for us. You're always, you know, you took care of us, but I just didn't want the normal life. I was just like, what's going on? So I knew that I needed to trigger you in one way, shape or form. So I went and I grabbed you by the love handle and I was like, sounds like we're getting a little comfortable and I remember you just went whoosh, like you just like my hand just like and you're like what did you tell me and I was like sounds like we're getting a little comfortable 
and I just saw you, your face was just like so, like you were pissed. And I remember you slammed the door, you walked into the garage, you didn't even go to work, you didn't do anything, you canceled everything, and you started just, you went in there, you turn on the radio for full blast, and you just started working out like crazy, and it was like, man, like what did I just do? Like this, I've never seen you that pissed off, but I felt like I needed to do something to get you triggered to realize that that normality was not us. Like, I did not sign up for a life that we were going to feel like there was more potential in you and me, in that matter, that I needed to do something to just shake you. And and that's what happened. You got shaken up, you went into the garage, you freaking came back, and it's like, you know, I don't know what it is about that medicine with you in the gym, but like when you come back, you know, like there's times when we're just like something could be happening. I'm like, you need to go to the gym, go to the gym right now and come back and you show up with this freaking energy and it's freaking amazing. And after that day, I remember you came back, you reset and it was a very hard reset. Like the kids, like you started to really, I mean, you were playing Barbies with the girls, playing basketball with Ian outside our son. You were showing more love. You were, you were being more sexual. You were, and then all of a sudden I noticed your phone calls with work. Like you were, you had this new level. Like you just needed that reset. And that's what it, that's what it was. And that's why I think a lot of times, like we do need to get pissed off to realize what that is but that was my way to trigger you and now you're taking it out on everybody pulling on their love handles and taking their shirts off everywhere and i'm just like sorry that was me like i started that so well i needed to change so bad and honestly like i'm not sure if it triggered somewhere like along the way like maybe when i was a kid or something but it just triggered me and i was like dude like this is my wife and she's gonna do this to me and at first there was this ego that I was mm-hmm. like, I can't believe you just disrespected me like that. So I understand when I grab someone else, I know that they're thinking, I can't believe you did that. You just disrespected me. I, then, I don't I don't know how anybody hasn't punched you in the face for that, honestly. But <laughs> but then but then I thought, she's right. I'm like Can you say that again? Yeah, but no, I said she's right. <laughs> One more time. Yeah, she's right. I'm just kidding. That <laughs> I was capable of more. I was getting soft. I was conforming. I was having mediocrity crawl over me. I was doing better than most. And I was living in the box that the world put on me. And I decided to break that bitch wide open. And, the, and, the and I thing, needed to get pissed. I needed anger. No, I get it. And, and the thing is that I didn't do it to hurt you. I mean, I wasn't being malicious. I just knew that there was something inside of you that needed to be woken up, something that had fallen asleep, that needed to be shaken up to the point where you needed something to be, to trigger you. And sometimes as wives, I mean, we're really good at that, but it just depends. Sometimes it's like some, we have to take the emotion out of a lot of things that people tell us and be like, Hey, is this good for me or bad for me? And that's, that's how things work, you know? And, and I think that that you, you realize that's what you had to do. And you said, Hey, you know what? Maybe I am getting comfortable. Maybe I do need to change. Maybe I do deserve to have a better life. And you're like, if I were to change this, is this going to be better for our family? And you thought about those things, and it was a yes. And I think a lot of times people don't change because they get defensive or because they take it the wrong way or they from the people they love. Like they might tell them that they need to change something, and they won't do it because they don't sit back and take that emotion out and think, hey, is this good for me or not good for me? If they were to be asking you to do something bad, then I get it. But they're typically not. Positive peer pressure. Yes, it's that positive peer pressure. But society teaches you like, hey, you know what? Like, this is me. I'm the man. I shouldn't have to put up with this shit. Like, I can do this and you shouldn't be telling me what to do. Yeah, well, I was going to say also, um, this is important to every leader that's watching this. Um, The reason why I think we have one of the biggest leadership self-development programs on planet Earth is because I was an entitled leader, okay? I worked really hard. I busted my ass. Everybody yes sir me all day long. You were a professional babysitter. Yeah. Well, my point is, is that so when I got home, I was so used to people saying yes to me, 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 yes to me. You didn't like when I told you no. And then, you know, here I got Jackie saying no. And I'm like, or like even triggering me and telling me I I need to do better. I need to get in better shape. I need to be a better dad. You know, I need to be better to you. And I'm like, hold on. 
And I'm like, all these other people see all this value in me. And then I'm like, you don't freaking see value in me. And like, so I was, that's entitlement. Like I was getting so entitled when actually you knew that there was like so many levels to me that most people would never believe in me to go to any of these new levels, but you did. And that was so hard for me to be, to kill my ego. And once I did, I started to become Mm open-minded to the fact that if you're right and I can really do this shit better, we can 20 X our family life and dude, and we did it. And like the crazy thing is, is I think a lot of people, when I tell them that they're capable of more now, which is why I just trigger people constantly is because I'm hoping that someone will get pissed off, take the path that I took 20 X their family's life. And then they'll sit back and say, dude, the best thing that ever happened to me was you were direct with me. I needed that. And interestingly enough, the biggest transformations in what we've had going on had to do with some type of fitness first. And then they became better, you know, in their marriages and and business just skyrocketed. And it's insane how how people like we get criticized so much by that and they don't really understand. But it's it's a whole it's a whole shift and change. Everybody who does it understands. Everybody who does it understands. They have to go through it. Well, it's like the reason why we talk about fitness so much, you know, is because, you know, it's something that everybody has given up on in one time or another Mm -hmm. in their life and more than once. So it's like if you can combat that and you can really do that then it makes it easier to do a lot of hard things that happen and that's that for me that's my biggest driver when it comes to fitness if i can get up in the morning if i can do that that i know that i can do all these other things that are hard Mm -hmm. because we deal with a lot of hard stuff at at any given time you know with our business and everything that comes our way i mean every there's always a challenge we have to become very adaptable and we love what we do there's always something that doesn't work out perfectly though Mm -hmm. every single time and that's why we've become so adaptable but we had to go through that first Uh, yeah well intentionally doing hard stuff when hard stuff happens it's just pretty easy to handle right but when you don't intentionally do hard stuff, like you don't go on long runs, you don't do hard workouts, you don't do those things, then when something hard comes along, you actually think that that's hard. Right. And that's why I think that we intentionally like try to press ourselves every morning. Plus, how many times have you went and you were gonna speak on stage or you were gonna do anything, you were gonna lead a sales meeting, you are gonna do anything. Like, when you exercise, like, your brain is really operating at a really high level. And you, you, you think right? a lot faster like your when mental you do clarity that. is like mm-hmm. super sharp. Yeah. That's why you'll notice like we're on the road traveling, like no matter what we're doing, we do work out. But before I ever speak or anything or we do, Mm -hmm. like we have to hit that gym because it activates my brain, um, you know. And uh, so let's talk about one more thing. Uh, What's possible? Okay, because this is super important because Mm -hmm. you've lived this life with me for the last 18 years. Yeah. Um, We have a life right now that you may say, I already knew we were going to live that life one day. I didn't know that we were going to live that life. Like, I, I'm, I'm truthful. Like, I, no. I, I want you to talk about how I was deeply rooted into my identity of who I was mm-hmm. and how you kept trying to tell me that you saw more in me. And yeah. it was really hard for me to understand that because of my upbringing or the way I was programmed. Yeah, well, a lot of it in the beginning, you know, I was the one that was the ballsy one, you know. <laughs> When I when I moved, uh, you know, to your city, I was a ballsy one. I was like, hey, why are you still doing or in the same position? You've been here for 10 years. You know, we had very similar lives. And, you know, I was like, oh, I've been promoted the last, you know, two years. I've been through all of these things, been promoted so many times. And you're still doing the same thing in your position for 10 years. Like, what are you talking about? I do better than any, everybody in my family. You know, I make more money than anybody in my family. Who are you? I'm justifying. You were justifying it. And it's just like, man, you're so good at what you do. What if you just did this or you grew in this way? And it caused a lot of fights in the beginning. Mm-hmm. And until you finally understood, like, man, like, there is something else to me that that's not just the life that I have. And I think you find that you had the golden handcuff syndrome for a long time. And I think a lot of people get that, but you were almost like to the point, like you, a lot of people, you know, come like, like us. I mean, there's a lot of people that have bad upbringings that don't, don't have the best examples and they want to prove themselves in different ways. And they're like, you know, Hey, you know what? I'm going to go and be the first in my family. I think you found out that you could be the first in your family, but you were still limited 
in where you were. It's like not just the best in your family. You got to be the best in your city, the best in your state, the best in the world at everything you do. And I think it happened because I was just really ballsy and because I grew up with, you know, a dad that was a failed entrepreneur that kept failing over and over and over and over and over. And I saw it as a as as a young woman, you know, I started working and I was like, man, what's the worst that can happen? I've already failed my entire life. Mm -hmm. I come from a family of failure. And then you grew wings and you're like, man. So when you started believing in yourself, though, is when the magic happened, because I, before it was a fight. And until you realize that you were capable and you really saw what I saw, you know, then you were like, oh, my gosh, we can go take over the world. But to tell you that, hey, I knew this was going to happen and you didn't know this was going to happen. You're like, oh, my gosh, I didn't know this was going to happen. I knew we had big dreams and I knew that we were going to be OK. And I knew that we're going to work harder than everybody else to chase whatever we needed. But God had a lot to do with what we have. Honestly, like I can plan something. God will make it 50 times better than what I even imagined. And that's just it. So I think we kept God as a center of our family, of our business and everything that we do that, yes, I did not know how far we were going to go. I knew we were going to go far because we had to move. God's not just going to tell you, hey, this is going to happen on its own. You have to put in the hard work. Mm -hmm. But I think that if you're doing the right thing, if you have the right mindset, if you have the right people around you, you know, you have all the resources to do it, you know. I'm Mexican, so I'm like, man, this country gives you so many more resources than you get mm -hmm. anywhere else in the world. So I'm just like, man, you know, I'm going to freaking run with it, and you're going to run with it too, and you're going to have, like, you know, the, the work ethic, and you're talented, and we're going to build this stuff together, and we're going to grow, and God has multiplied that, and I believe that's what he does. Yeah, God's definitely, his plans are way crazier than ours. Yeah. Um, we just got to trust him. Okay, one last thing. Okay. All right, and this is something that we've never talked about. Okay. Okay. No. Do you remember when I changed? Mm -hmm. I never really talked about this, but I was just thinking about this the other day. Do you remember how I never was on the internet my whole life? Like I never was on it. I mean, I stole your Facebook account because I yes, didn't know how to Yes, you stole one. my Facebook account. Yes, I did steal your Facebook account, but I want to say It went from here. Jacqueline and then everybody was like, does Andy have a Facebook? So I added the corny little Jacqueline, Jacqueline Andy, Andy Elliot yeah. type of thing. And then that, it was Andy Elliot. And then all <laughs> and of a sudden my name disappeared. I was like, <laughs> hey, what happened to my Facebook? But, but I want to talk about the, the importance of this. Um, new people, right? New information, new experiences. You become a new person. Right. And, and, and we hear that and everybody knows that. But I want you to go back specifically mm -hmm. to when I made the decision to start self-developing, right? Mm -hmm. Really think about this. Yeah. I would wake up in the morning. And I would go to Starbucks. Do you remember? And you wouldn't even let me buy Starbucks because no, you wouldn't because let me we're spend in money. Save mode. We, right. went, we went psycho. If you think you made some sacrifices, I mean, you need to talk to us. Cause. Yeah, but, but I want you to remember, I went to Starbucks and I couldn't buy Starbucks because you wouldn't let me. So, but you told you me. You sound like such a bias. No, 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 It no. wasn't that. We had big goals. We had big goals, but you told me, I would, you would say, I'd wake up and I'd say, I'm going to study today. I'm going to train today. Does that make sense? Yeah. And you were like, okay, cool. And I would leave the house yeah. and I would go to Starbucks and not buy a Starbucks. And I would sit at Starbucks for probably eight to 10 hours. Do you remember? I'd be gone all day. Yeah. Like I went to work and I didn't go to work. I went to work. No, you didn't. Well, I there went. There wasn't any money going into the bank account. No, I know. I know you didn't work. But I went and worked on me. Do you remember? <laughs> yes. Yes. When I say the term work harder on yourself than you do on your job. A lot of people think that that's like a quote. Mm -hmm. I actually did it. When I heard Jim Rohn say, work harder on yourself than you do on your job, yeah. I thought, I've worked hard on my job for 22 years, yeah. and this is where we are. But I think a lot of people misunderstand that, and then just lazy people just don't work. <laughs> no, no, but I had always worked. But now yeah. I went, and I remember I put headphones on, yeah. and all I did was take in information for 10 hours a day for weeks at a time and basically and i i know you remember this mm -hmm. i was brainwashing myself i literally took everything i learned my whole you're life building your library in your head yeah Yeah, and i i was like the world's your library if you know what you're looking for to give you what you're looking for i started writing down everything that i heard and i literally reprogrammed my mind mm -hmm. and um i just we never really talk about that but like i disappeared yeah and I literally well. First of all, I kicked you out of the house because you started recording videos and you were stacking like all of my file boxes 
over and over and you'd try to record yourself. You couldn't even say, hi, hey guys, it's Andy Elliott. I, I like had to tell you how to say, hey guys, it's Andy Elliott. Like it was like awkward and it took it was like- tra- all... It was like training a newborn baby. It was training a newborn baby. But, you know, it was like, you need to get out of the house and you need to go and, you know, you need to, you know, train and get better. Because in the very beginning, when we started our company, like you would go out, nobody knew who you were. Nobody. Nobody. And it was like, you know, we were like calling these different places, dealerships, like, oh, Andy Elliott, this is like, who the hell is that? You know, and I was calling these places too, and nobody knew. So I was just calling. We, we had these like little DVDs that we would sell and training and all this other stuff we'd mail out. So I was, it was, it was all the stuff. And it, you know, I think we charged like 37 bucks and then we had to pay shipping. And by the time you did all the other stuff, and ma- I had a, this DVD burner. Jackie was burning DVDs. I was burning DVDs that you couldn't duplicate and all this other stuff I was just like we're just trying to make ends meet so as I'm selling these DVDs you're self-investing and trying to build your library in your head so you can learn what to talk to people about and then we didn't even have a product to sell Mm -hmm. so we started you started creating all these videos on YouTube and then people would call at like two o'clock in the morning and we would answer and then you'd be like, I'm going to the bathroom. You're in the bathroom. I hear you're going to the bathroom and talking to these people. And we're like, we got a lead. Oh, my gosh, we got a lead. But we had nothing to sell them. Yeah. And it was the craziest, craziest thing. But just that hard work and investing in yourself and learning that, obviously, all of those hours, the 8 to 10 hours at Starbucks, not buying the coffee, but going there just to invest in yourself, is paying off right now. Yeah. Tenfold, hundredfold, a millionfold now. It's just all of that stuff, all that work that's done in the dark. A lot of people look at, hey, how are you scaling so fast? How are you growing so fast? I don't understand it. You guys have only been in business for this long. Well, it was all of that freaking time, all of that work in the dark that it took to self-invest and grow and build our marriage and build our family and build whatever we envisioned to be our team that we have today in the dark for years of all the beatings that we took to be able to create something that we knew that didn't exist and not really having anybody to model, really, to just going out and doing it and putting that heart in it, but it, it, it pays off. So that's mm-hmm. self-investing, that time. You might think, hey, you know what? I'm spending all of this time trying to read all these books. Nothing's happening. Well, it might take a little bit more time. It might take that extra hour or two or going to Starbucks and not buying anything and buckling down on your finances, but investing yourself, putting yourself to that grinder so that when you go out there, You actually have that grit to actually Mm -hmm. build something that's sustainable because you're going to get shut down like we did so many different times in the very beginning. Mm -hmm. And you just kind of have to keep going and that's it. Yeah. So I think someone is somewhere today and you're like, man, I want to change my life. Right. And just like I sat down and I started reading books and I started and I was really hard for me to comprehend new information in the beginning. Yeah. You didn't you didn't like like to read. Yeah. I used to read you children's Bible stories in the very beginning because you, you just didn't like studying. So you you started seeing that you loved that investment in yourself and your brain started growing. You started getting creative and you started thinking like a lot of different things. So you just got addicted to that, which mm-hmm. is so awesome. Uh, because, you know, when you don't see that there's something at the other, like at the end of the tunnel, you don't see that it's going to pay off. Mm-hmm. Our BHAG, our big, hairy, audacious goal was so big that we just knew we have to keep reading, we have to keep investing ourselves, mm-hmm. we have to keep growing. And even though we don't see anything now, it's going to happen. And that um, was it. So I wanna say one more thing, because I think this is something that, yeah. you know, be, becoming a student of the game is real, right? Mm-hmm. Like it's real. And um, I, I maybe have told this story maybe like one time, but do you remember when I was in sales, okay? and Every morning I'd wake up, I'd read the Bible, right. and you would see me practicing uh, negotiations, closing. I'd have scratch paper everywhere, mm-hmm. and I would write like every morning. Right. And you would get up, and then by the time you were up, I was already gone. Yeah. But you would save all those little pieces of paper every morning. And when five years later, me and Jackie decided to open our sales training company, Jackie pulled out a box of all now, the stuff I ever wrote. I am not a pack rat by any means. I hate clutter. I hate clutter and you would write like these little things on napkins or like little note, note, uh, notebook paper or whatever it is and you write like these little clothes but because we kind of came from the same field and we understood each other, I would get up in the morning I would take a look at it 
And I remember I would be like, okay, this is we're doing a price, a money justification thing. Okay, good. And I would kind of like, like write on it or whatever. But I would save all of those things. I would save all those papers. So I had. But I didn't boxes. know you were saving them. No, you didn't know I was saving all that stuff. So, fast forward, years happened after that. I, you know, we needed to write our first course. So what happened was that I kicked you out of the house with the kids because we didn't have any help back then. We didn't have any family that would help us with anything. Like we just kind of did everything ourselves. So it was like, hey, mom and pop shop, we're building a business. Take the kids, get out of the house, and I'm going to write this course that we need to write out. Mm -hmm. So I brought out all of these little pieces of paper from all of the time that you wrote all of these notes because, you know, I, I read them and understood them and I knew your language because I know you so well that I wrote out all of our courses based on those napkins, structured courses from A to Z. So it was our best course we ever released. It's the best course I ever released, but yeah, wrote that course off of napkins and notes from all of yeah. these years, and I had no idea why I was saving all of these, mm -hmm. but I saved them, and I don't save anything because yeah. I don't like keeping clutter, yeah. but I saved those. So there was a way that, you know, God told me, hey, you know what? Save this piece of paper. One day it's going to come in handy, and it sure did. So that was awesome. I'm grateful for that. Yeah, super crazy, guys. And by the way, never really told that story, but every morning I would wake up, read the Bible, and then I would start practicing negotiating. I'd be like, price too high, payments too high, I want more for my trade, I'm going to get it back with you, I need to think about it. I, I got to talk to my other wife. I would just write down all these different scenarios, and then I'd hand write out word tracks, like things that I would say, and then I would practice them, and I would go to work, and I'd make money. And you'd leave them on the table. Yep, and I'd leave them on the table. It and every like a table like this, yeah, actually, very similar yeah. to and this. And every day that I would come home, I mean, the Bible was put up over here, all the scratch paper was gone, I would figure she was just trashing them all. And I never thought about it. And then when we started our company, she pulled out the steel and I started looking. I was like, oh my gosh, like, I can't believe like, and there was just all this training. And she's like, I'm going to structure all this. I'm going to put this together. And then I came back. We had an entire 21 section. Yeah. 21 video, 13 hours of training content that I shot. And we created this insane course, how to make a hundred grand quick in sales and how to make it over and over and over again. And literally like people all around the world were like, oh my God, that changed my life, changed my life. Yeah. That was all the napkin writing. Jackie took it in and we built it. So anyways, little backstory on me and Jacqueline. Yeah. Um, she's amazing. Life is cool. You know, I, I want to say one more thing. I think a lot of people are, are like, hey, you take care of me, I'll take care of you. Don't most people operate like that? Yeah. yeah you take care of me, I'll take care of you. I think what me and you did is how we changed our life is that I was like, I'll take care of me for you. When I got better, I took better care of you. I took mm -hmm. better care of our kids. I became a good leader. We grew a company. Yeah. Um, you took care of me forever. But once you stopped taking care of me and you started taking care of you, you took care of you for me. Mm -hmm. And when I saw you get 10 times stronger, 10 times better, you know, 10 times, you know, more creative, 10 times more ballsy, 10 times more loving. When I started seeing all this stuff, dude, the fact that I was close to you and you were getting better, it made me better. Right. It's you a know, domino effect. So yeah. I think a lot of times, uh, you know, people are, are especially with with us women, I can speak on my behalf because I'm a woman like we have this idea that we need to take care of our kids and our husband before we take care of ourselves. And I think that that's, that's all great. And if I had a sick kid or something were to happen to you, I would do it in a heartbeat. I mean, obviously you guys are my priority, but what I do have to say is that I wasn't doing anything that inspired you or the kids to wanna be like me or that showed anything that what an example looks like yeah i was loved oh mom she's a comforting one. Oh mom she's going to take care of us oh mom is going to you know and i was walking around with the bun everywhere and i wasn't really valuing myself so when i i realized i had to sit back and think hey how can i be a better example to show my daughters and my son what a woman needs to look like or feel. And that was thinking about myself. It was working out. It was getting dressed in the morning. It was not eating cold food. It was me thinking for myself. And now I can tell you it changed everything. You started looking at me with different eyes. You know, the girls look up to me as, as their mentor and hero. Our son knows what a mom and a wife would probably if we, he would want to model to have on his in his own you know that kind of stuff like sometimes we give so much to the people that we love to the point where you know I was a slave I was a slave and I'm telling you I would do it all over again and I don't regret any of it 
But I'm telling you that my kids look at me so differently once I started caring about myself. You're just huge. like just like when you started believing in yourself. The reason why I was attracted to you was because you carried yourself a certain way because, you know, you you were confident because of all of these different things. And it's the same reason why I was attractive to you because you thought I was independent because you knew I carried myself well mm-hmm. because you saw that I was a confident woman. And then somehow in marriage, we lost that. We forgot what it was like. We forgot and we decided to be like, hey, I'm going to take care of him. He's going to take care of me type of thing. And we didn't take care of each other. We got away from trying to prove ourselves to just comforting each other and mm-hmm. being there for each other, maybe doing things that we don't want to do or making too many sacrifices in the sense that you're like, hey, I'm, I'm going to do this because I'm taking care of him or taking care of the kids, that you lose yourself. And then all of a sudden that newness wears off and then you're not, you're not where you need to be. So turn by taking care poo-poo. of yourself first, you turn into poo-poo. And then by not taking care of myself, I wasn't being the example I needed for you and the kids. And once you started taking care of yourself, you turned into a freak. Oh, sorry. Oh, oh Yeah. Oh. Anyway, so there's lots of benefits, guys, to making there's, sure that you guys take care of yourself. And uh, But baby girl, love you. I just want to tell you that you're the best. Okay. And uh, make sure that if you're out there, you show your girl lots of love today, your man lots of love, totally recreate your life. Um, You have no idea what's possible. And if you have somebody and you're doing life with them, make sure you take them with you and grow with them, okay? And if if we can do it, if we can do it, you you can can all do it. We were the least qualified to do what we're doing right now. Yep. I love it. All right, guys. See you in the next podcast. Let's roll. See ya. Hey guys, I just want to tell you, the true one percenters, you made it till the end of the video. Do me a favor, share it with the friend that wants to go to another level. Make sure you like the video, comment below so I know who you are. Set your notifications and then subscribe to the channel. We got daily sales training videos dropping. I'll see you soon.